Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the webinar, Collaboration and Efficiency in Design and Construction, Contract Considerations for Design Assist, Delegated Design, and the Early Start of Construction. This is a webinar brought to you by AIA Contract Documents. Thank you very much for joining us today. We're gonna to go over a few administrative items before we get started. First off, uh, please be advised that all attendees are currently muted. At the end of the presentation, time permitting, we'll answer any questions um, that we can. Um, you'll also receive this recording as well as the PowerPoint from today's webinar via email. Um, you'll most likely get this by tomorrow or early next week. At the conclusion of the webinar, attendees will also be emailed a certificate of attendance through GoToWebinar. You can use that certificate to self-report your attendance to any continuing education systems um, as well. This presentation is protected by US and international copyright laws. So reproduction, distribution, display, and use of the presentation without written permission is prohibited. And also the statements expressed today uh, by our presenters reflect their own views. And with that, what I'd like to do now is turn it over to our first presenter to uh, introduce themselves, Ken. Thank you, Hosti, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Ken Cobley, and I am the Vice President and Counsel for the AIA Contract Documents Program. Uh, in that role, I oversee the work of a team of seven other attorneys, um, and we're responsible for, among other things, the development of new or revised AIA Contract Documents content. Uh, prior to joining the AIA Contract Documents Program in 2006, um, I spent about 18 years as a construction litigation attorney in uh, two mid-size uh, firms in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, and during that time, I represented contractors, subcontractors, owners, and design professionals in a wide variety of uh, cases, controversies, um, and other matters. So that's my background and, and who I am, and, and uh, we'll turn, I will turn it over to the next speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Robin Banks, and I am a principal in the law firm of Goldberg and Banks in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, we are a construction boutique firm, full service, who represents uh, clients across the construction, construction spectrum, uh, from owners to CMs and contractors, architects and engineers, and subs as well. In addition to my private practice, for the past 11 or a drop more years, uh, I have served as an associate outside counsel to the AIA Contract Documents Committee. Um, in that role, I help with the development and update of new and existing AIA contract documents. Uh, and I was directly involved in the development of several of the documents that we're going to talk about today. Sarah? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Bauer, and I work as a manager and counsel, and counsel at the AIA Contract Documents Program. Much like what Ken and Robin mentioned, I work with our documents committee in drafting and revising AIA contract documents. Prior to, to my time in this role, I worked in private practice as a construction law attorney in Chicago, Illinois. Well, great. Um, thank you, everyone. And uh, I hope that, uh, that the attendees can understand that uh, we're getting a, a wide variety of perspectives and a pretty deep uh, background in construction law uh, from the speakers and presenters on the program today. Um, before we dive into uh, the details of some of the specific documents we're going to talk about, I'd like to just present a brief overview of the AIA contract documents uh, program. 
So the AIA contract documents uh, program has published standard form agreements since 1888. And no, that is not a typo, and, and I didn't misspeak. So we're 120, 130 years into the process. Um, the AIA contract documents have long been viewed as the industry standard, reflecting current industry practices and fairly balancing the risks and responsibilities of each of the project participants. Um, in order to stay current, uh, the AIA contract documents program generally reviews and revises its delivery models or families of documents on a 10-year cycle. And many of you are probably very familiar with that notion of the 10-year revision cycle, particularly when it comes to some of the uh, key delivery models like the design bid build model that has been re reviewed and revised on the sevens for the past 30 or 40 years, uh, CM on the nines and so forth. Between the cycles for the review and revision of the major delivery models and, and often to supplement uh, the work done on these delivery models, the AIA contract documents uh, program will publish new documents to address trends in the industry or uh, needs that were identified uh, as part of some of the larger uh, model uh, delivery model reviews. Uh, and and um, you're you're going to hear about some of those more recent uh, new documents arising out of the work that the documents committee and the attorneys on the team did with respect to the construction management uh, delivery documents. And so that's that's sort of a little bit of background on, on how uh, that all uh, came about. Um, in addition, I, I just wanna mention that um, this is a, a pretty iterative drafting process. And uh, in it, in addition to working with the AIA's Contract Documents Committee, we work with a number of outside uh, industry liaisons, uh, oftentimes members from the American Bar Association Forum on Construction Law will provide input uh, and review drafts of our documents, similarly for the American College of Construction Lawyers, and, uh, and often we're able to identify just individuals with particular expertise. So um, we prepare drafts, have them commented on and reviewed, pre prepare secondary drafts that go out to the industry uh, until we think we're at a point where the document truly reflects uh, a common view and understanding and one um, that meets the needs of most, if not all, of the project participants. Um, in trying to achieve our goals, the documents, AIA contract documents program has a number of drafting principles. Um, among them is the goal of establishing and maintaining standardized forms that enhance the stability uh, for the design and construction industry, um, providing standardized documents as an alternative to expensive manuscript documents, um, striving to produce documents that are fair and balanced and taking into account um, common law precepts uh, as well as um, allocating risks to the parties that are in the best position to either manage the risk or ensure against that risk. So that's a bit of the background and some of the uh, logic and understanding of how the AIA contract documents program works. Now I think we can dive into uh, the details of this program. To give everybody some background, this presentation is centered around the following hypothetical. PLI University wants to build a new, unique, state-of-the-art football stadium on its campus. Someone on the board of trustees of the university saw an amazing metal facade fabricated by a certain consultant 
on the outside of the NFL football stadium in the neighboring town and decided that the university just had to have one too. The university is hoping that the project can be completed within an 18 month time frame so that it will be available for opening day of the football season. PLIU has decided to use the CM at risk delivery method in the hopes that the collaboration between the architect and construction manager during the pre-construction phase will help to fast track the project, identify potential constructability and scheduling issues on the front end, and minimize the amount of claims and changes on the back end. PLIU does a does its due diligence and hires a certain construction manager to serve as its construction manager. The parties sign an AIA A133 owner CM agreement with a guaranteed maximum price. PLIU has selected a certain architect to serve as its architect on the project. And the university the university wants to use a consultant to design, fabricate, and install the metal facade. The consultant services and work is divided into two parts. First, the design phase services, where the consultant is going to design the metal facade. Second, the construction phase services, where the consultant is going to fabricate and install the facade. Ken, would you like to discuss the construction manager as constructor delivery model and how it impacts the university's plans? Sure, thanks, Sarah. Um, so you see on your screen what we call uh, a relationship diagram, and it is uh, designed to show the various contractual relationships between the parties uh, in the CM as constructor, sometimes known as CM at risk delivery model, and as reflected in the AIA's contract documents for that delivery model. model. So in the center of all of this, you find the owner. Um, and the diagram reflects that as part of the process, and I think you heard as part of the uh, material that Sarah presented, the owner is going to engage an architect, and the architect and its consultants are going to be res primarily responsible for the development of the design of the project. The owner is also going to hire a construction manager as constructor or a construction manager at risk. And the CM at risk is going to actually uh, play a part in two phases of the project. The CM and its subcontractors, trade contractors, is going to be responsible for the construction of the project so long as the owner and the CM can come to, in this case, uh, an agreed upon guaranteed maximum price. But the whole purpose of, of, of using the CM as constructor delivery model is to try to engage the CM early on while the project is still in the design phase and allow the construction manager and perhaps some of its uh, trade contractors to inform the design and thereby hopefully create uh, time savings, uh, cost savings, uh, things that will happen during that phase will include constructability review, perhaps uh, several rounds of cost estimating and so on and so forth. And so in this delivery model, the construction manager is going to be brought on early in the process so that its knowledge of construction and the and the trades and so on and so forth can help inform the design and thereby hopefully result in several levels of savings uh, in time and money to the owner. It, I would just also note that there is an opportunity for the owner uh, also in this to bring on other owner direct consultants for any specialty needs that they might have either for the design and that would all be integrated into the work of the primary uh, design team. So that's an overview, if you will, of the CM as constructor delivery model, which is in fact the delivery model that was chosen for this hypothetical project. So um, let's, we're going to focus in, in this program, we're going to 
focus on the relationships between three of the key um, project participants for this type of delivery model. As I mentioned, the architect and its consultants are going to be res primarily responsible for the design. The construction manager is going to have some levels of input into that design. And the consultant, uh, in this case, a facade design manufacturer install entity, is also going to be brought in early to provide some assistance during the design phase um, and, and then do some work in the construction phase. So as you can see from this slide, again, repeating, the consultant services are going to be just like the CM services. The consultant services are going to begin in the design phase by helping to inform the design team about uh, nuances associated with this facade. And then we'll uh, hopefully, assuming that everybody gets to the right GMP, uh, continue into the construction phase. Robin, do you want to talk about the consultant services during the design phase? Sure, Sarah. So the initial services that the consultant is going to provide are design assist services. Design assist is a form of collaboration where a construction professional, like our consultant, provides information to help the architect of records design, typically before pricing for the work has been agreed on or before the work has been awarded. Because our project and our hypothetical is very time sensitive, having the consultant involved in the design from the outset can provide some real tangible benefits for the project. The consultant can hopefully help provide cost-effective design solutions. Uh, their input will hopefully help reduce uh, coordination conflicts once construction begins. And again, as Ken said a couple minutes ago, the, the real benefit of getting the consultant involved at this stage is ideally time and cost savings down the line, fewer change orders, uh, and hopefully a better chance of schedule adherence. So the university is not sure about the best way to contract with the consultant. Should it contract directly with the consultant? Should the consultant be under the architect since they're helping out with the design? Or should the consultant be under the CM? And then their last question is, what should the contract look like? So back in October of last year, the AIA published a new document, C43, that will hopefully help in that regard. The C43, well, sorry, C403, is an agreement between a client and a consultant where the client hires a consultant to provide design assist services. The document is drafted to be agnostic so that anyone, whether it's the university, the CM, or the architect, can contract for design assist services. And the document can be used on any delivery method. Most likely, it's going to be CM or design build. Now, here in our example, because the consultant is going to be providing services during both design and construction phases, we think the best option is for the CM to hire the consultant to provide the design assist services instead of either the university or the architect. And when we were drafting this document, this is what we expected would be the most common use of the document, that it would be most likely a CM who was hiring the consultant. So now that we know who's going to hire the consultant, let's talk about the specific types of services that the consultant is going to provide. So in our hypothetical, the consultant's going to provide three types of design assist services. First, it's going to consult with the owner, the design team, and the CM, so we can understand the concept or aesthetics of what the owner is looking for in a facade. Then, once it has that information, it's going to prepare and provide to the CM and the owner and the design team two or three different design options to choose from. There will inevitably be follow-up consultation and meetings involved with the selection. And finally, once the owner chooses its preferred option, the consultant's gonna move on and do some spatial coordination, do some 3D modeling, and prepare ultimately a full-scale prototype of that option. This will help the CM and the design team understand how this facade is gonna work in the field, 
And it will also help the CM ensure coordination among trades when it's contracting with its other co subcontractors for the construction phase. Does the consultant need a license to provide its design assist services? The short answer to that question, Sarah, is it depends. The C403 itself doesn't require that the consultant have a license unless it's required in the jurisdiction where the project is located. But whether the jurisdiction where the project is located requires a license is likely going to depend on the actual services that are being provided. If it's professional services being provided, most likely a license is going to be needed. If it's non-professional services, it will depend. It may not be as likely. Here, in our example, to the extent that some of the design assist services being provided involve engineering or calculations, particularly at the latter stages of the process, as the consultant moves into coordination, modeling, and the like, they will need to have uh, licensed engineers on staff to do so, so a license will be required. But in the alternative, if our consultant was only providing services, uh, information on, for example, the types of materials to use in the facade, perhaps scheduling for the fabrication work, um, or, or some estimates of cause, uh, cost, they may not need a license at this juncture. That makes sense. Design assist services come in a variety of shapes and sizes, though. To what standard of care should the consultant be performing its design assist services? Well, unlike typical architects and engineers who have to perform their services to a common law standard of care, there is no generally established standard of care for consultants performing design assist services because there is such a wide variety of services that they can provide. So when, when drafting the C1 of C403, I apologize, um, we drafted it to require the consultant to provide its services using reasonable care. And this is the same standard of care that we used in the A133 with regard to the CM when it's providing its pre-construction services. So the CM in the A133 uses reasonable care in pre-construction, and we flowed that same standard of care down to the um, consultant for the design assist services. You have talked about general responsibilities in this delivery system. What are some of the responsibilities of the parties as they interact in this design assist scenario? So when the, the consultant is performing its services, it has to do some, some typical things. It's got to get, provide a schedule for its services and, and coordinate its services with the CM, the architect, and the other project participants. It has to review information that it gets from the CM, and it has to provide its uh, design, modeling, and prototype deliverables to the CM in accordance with the protocols regarding transmission and use and reliance that are developed by the parties, uh, most typically in whatever the higher tier agreement is. But as part of the collaborative design process, the consultant has several other responsibilities too. It has to participate in discussions, meetings, and, and other communications with the project participants, which include the owner, the architect, the CM, and all of their respective consultants. And if and to the extent that the CM owes some sort of submissions to the architect during the pre-construction phase of the project, the consultant's going to have to review how the CM incorporates its design assist services into those submissions and let the CM know of any errors or inconsistencies or, or feedback that it may have so it can make sure that everything gets incorporated accurately. So like the consultant, the CM also has some sort of typical and then some design assist specific responsibilities. Um, it has to prepare a schedule for the consultant's services uh, in the context of sort of the overall project schedule. So uh, with the CM's other uh, contractors and consultants who are providing design assist services or pre-con services. It has to provide information to the consultant regarding requirements and limitations on its services. Um, information that the consultant may need to perform its services, and, and notifications to the consultant of any changes in the design that actually may affect their services. Then it has to coordinate uh, the consultant services with those provided by the CM and the other project participants, and, and figure out whether and to what extent the consultant services need to be incorporated into the submissions that it needs to give during pre-construction, um, and give the consultant the opportunity to review those submissions um, and tell them of any errors in the deliverables. So 
The CM and consultant are not the only ones uh, who have responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis the design assist services. The architect does as well. But the architect's responsibilities are not spelled out in the C403. They're more generally set forth in the agreement between the owner and the architect for the project. Relative to the design assist services, the architect has three main responsibilities. First, it has to review the design assist services that are provided by the consultant through the construction manager. It has to incorporate those design assist services into its overall design, much like it does with any other consultant that the architect hires. They've got to always review the services of their subconsultants and incorporate them into the architect's overall design and identify and resolve any design conflicts. And ultimately, at this stage of the process, the architect is going to be the one signing and sealing the overall design and is going to be professionally responsible for it. Is the C403 a typical consultant agreement, like an architect consultant agreement, where the construction manager flows down the terms of the prime agreement to the consultant? The short answer to that, Sarah, is no. And that's because the architect and not the consultant is the one who's professionally responsible for incorporating the design assist services into the design. The only provisions that are gonna flow down are the ones that will apply to the design assist services, and they have to be specifically called out in the C403 agreement. Some examples of provisions that the CM may want to flow down are going to be the owner's prog program or criteria, specifically as it relates to the facade or exterior skin of the building, um, or any other services to be provided by the consultant. The project's physical characteristics, as they may again impact the consultant services, and the owner's anticipated design phase milestone dates. And, and all of this information, if, if you were looking at an A133, would be found up in the initial information. But the CM is also going to want to call out any other provisions that are in A133 or whatever its, its prime agreement is, which affect the scope of the design assist services that are going to be performed by the consultant during the pre-construction phase of the project. And again, all of those are going to want to be specifically called out in the C403. There's a fill point for it, and that's where all that information goes. So the, the next question is, well, to what degree can anyone rely on these design assist services? So the consultant can rely on the uh, adequacy, accuracy, completeness, and timeliness of all of the information and documents that it's going to receive from the CM and, and, or, or the client and the other project participants. Likewise, the CM and the other project participants, which includes the architect, are gonna be entitled to rely on the accuracy, completeness, timeliness of, of the services and information that are furnished by the consultant in providing the design assist deliverables if there are any. But the caveat here is what we've already said, that the architect maintains responsibility for incorporating those services, the design assist services, into the design and identifying and resolving design conflicts. If the A403 doesn't contain the typical flow down provisions, since the consultant will be preparing the instruments of service, how are those then handled? Are they handled in the same way as the B101 and the C401? Well, so under a design assist, we're going to start with sort of the long established premise under the AIA contract documents that the consultant's instruments of service are at stock in trade and that the consultant's going to retain all common law, statutory, and, and other reserved rights in the instruments of service that it prepares. And the consultant is going to give a limited, irrevocable, non exclusive license to its client to use the instruments of service for this project only. But where design assist is going to differ from the typical, uh, what, what, what the, the typical um, uh, design professional is obligated to give to the owner or the client is, is what the client is authorized to do with that license. So the top part of the slide is the B101 language. The bottom part of the slide is the C403 language. When you look at the B101 language, you will see that the owner is only permitted under the license to authorize the contractor and its subcontractors the right to reproduce applicable portions of the instruments of service for use in performing services or construction for the project. Under the C403, though, the license granted to the client, or the CM in our case, is going to permit the CM to authorize its other consultants 
and other project participants, including the architect and its consultants, the right to reproduce and make changes, corrections, and additions to the instruments of service for the purpose of preparing the pre-construction submissions and for designing, constructing, using, maintaining, and altering and adding to the project. Now, the reason why we took a different approach in the C403 from the typical B101 language is because the CM or the architect may need to modify the consultant's instruments of service at some point in order to either for the CM to fit it into their pre-construction submissions or for the architect to fit it into its ultimate design because again, at this stage, the uh, architect is professionally responsible for it. So our last topic relating to the consultant's design assist services is what types of insurance the CM should ensure that the consultant carries. So the consultant needs to have the typical coverages that are required, which is commercial general liability, automobile, workers' comp, and employer's liability. But professional liability is not a mandatory coverage for every consultant providing design assist services, and that's for a couple of reasons. Number one, the consultant during the design assist phase is not signing or sealing the deliverables that it provides. And second, there are some design assist consultants who aren't providing any professional services and we didn't want to make it mandatory that they have to carry professional liability insurance or they may not be able to procure it. So examples of some consultants um, who provide uh, uh, design assist services who may not need it are those who provide information on materials, um, uh, long lead items, um, perhaps some scheduling, uh, they, they uh, probably don't need professional liability insurance. But with that being said, the C403 does have a fill point to let the parties require it in their particular agreement. And here, in our example, because the consultant is going to be performing some engineering and calculations later in the design assist pro uh, process and going to be providing delegated design services that we'll talk about shortly, the CM is going to want the consultant to have this coverage. And Ken, earlier you mentioned that one of the benefits of the CM delivery method system is that construction can proceed simultaneously with pre-construction. Can you talk about that a bit? Sure. Um, so there are, I mean, I think that the environment that we have found ourselves in over the last uh, year or two sort of highlights uh, some elements that uh, of the of the trade of the industry that people can relate to, um, and that might be cause for parties trying to start the project early. I mean, we know that the global supply chain was and to a large degree still is a mess. Um, procuring uh, some materials is difficult um, and there's a fluctuating uh, cost associated with that. So locking down prices and getting materials in place uh, can be very important and can have a significant um, impact on the bottom line of a project. Uh, also, some manufactured items are taking excruciatingly long time lead times to uh, get to the project site. Uh, also, in a situation like we have in the hypothetical, it's very possible that uh, the, the owner, in this case the university, um, might want to really fast track this project um, because they might want to only miss, let's say, one full sports season or, you know, they really want to get it opened in time for a particular uh, event or football season. And so they, they would like to begin some of the work before the design is uh, finalized. In fact, before in this scenario, before even the design is to a point where the owner and the CM can um, reach agreement on the guaranteed maximum price. And so how do we do that? Um, in, in 2021, the AIA uh, created uh, a new document for use in the construction manager as constructor delivery model, and it's called the G735. Uh, the parties that contract for 
early release work using the G735 is the project owner and the CM. And the way that they contract for that work is they use this uh, G735 agreement type form. It's a very short form. It's only three or four pages. Um, and it becomes in incorporated into the underlying uh, CM agreement. In this case, the underlying A133. And so the parties complete this G735 form. They're going to indicate what document it's being incorporated into. They're going to put the date of the agreement between the owner and the CM in there. Uh, and then they are going to be prompted to identify the specifics of the early release work that, th that they are going to uh, begin based on this contract. And there are broad fill points uh, for a number of things. And as you can see, they, they're going to define the scope. They are going to select some options for specifics related to the early release work. So what do I mean by that? They're going to decide whether what of the many insurance coverages might actually be required for this early release work. You know, the underlying A133 is going to require a number of different insurance coverages, but the parties may agree that for this, only some of those coverages would be required depending on the nature of the early release work. They're going to decide whether or not a payment bond needs to go in place. They're going to decide a schedule for the early release work and how the CM is going to be compensated for the early release work, what the cost is going to be, what, if any, retainage there is. Now, I should mention with regard to the cost of the early release work, the document envisions that when the owner and CM ultimately uh, execute the uh, guaranteed maximum price amendment, that the early release work will be included as part of that uh, GMP. The other thing to note is upon execution, the G735 says that the CM will commence the construction phase of the project with respect to the early release work only. And that's important because there are elements within the A133 and A134 that um, are triggered at the construction phase of the project. So to the extent that there are terms in the A133 or 134, but in this case, the 133, that are applicable to construction phase activities, those terms will be applicable only as to the early release work. Uh, once the G735 is executed. Um, we, we believe that there was a need for this form in the industry, and we're getting anecdotal information in to suggest that there are a number of projects that are going to be using the CM as constructor or CM at risk delivery model, and parties interested in, in using the G735 to get certain phases of the project started so we're very uh we're excited about the continued use of of this document well that covers the consultant services during the design phase now what about the consultant services during the construction phase so the latter services that the consultant is going to perform on the project are going to be delegated design services and delegated design is generally defined as professional design services required by the architect or engineer for a limited predetermined component or system which the architect or engineer established performance or design criteria in the project specifications. And it's typically performed, as you just said, Sarah, during the construction phase. So one of the main benefits of delegated design is that it allows project participants like the CM to use people like the consultant who have specific expertise on a component or system. 
and who can apply that expertise to a portion of the project. So hopefully we can avoid um, uh, multiple review uh, of shop drawings, costly submission and resubmission of shop drawings, and it can efficiently and effectively accomplish uh, construction of, of a particular portion of the project. So the next two questions up on the slide are one, who contracts for delegated design services and how does delegated design occur? So let me answer the second question first. Um, actually, I think my, yeah, no, sorry about that. Um, so delegated design occurs because the contract documents through the performance specifications require the CM and contractor to perform certain professional design services. Here, the delegated design is gonna to relate to the fabrication and the installation of the metal facade, but, but some other common examples of delegated design that everybody's probably familiar with are curtain walls, uh, fire protection and sprinkler systems, and exterior steel stud framing. While delegated design has uh, become increasingly common and a new hot topic these days in the industry, it is far from a new concept in the AIA's contract documents. In fact, this practice has been acknowledged and has been uh, addressed for decades in the A201. Uh, there's a provision in Section 31210 for any uh, contract geeks out there like myself. Um, even though the AIA has never used the words delegated design, that concept has been addressed in their documents. So back to the first question of who contracts for delegated design. The answer is it's typically the CM or contractor, and they contract for these services through either a trade contractor or subcontractor who has an in-house design professional, or they do it directly with a licensed design professional. Now, in the past or, or currently, um, typically what the uh, CMs or contractors will do is they'll use their typical contractor subcontractor forms, which are really intended for construction work uh, rather than professional services. But the problem with these agreements is that they typically include uh, heightened standards of care and other uninsurable warranties and guarantees that construction contractors will typically agree to, but which are gonna give design professionals and their insurers and their attorneys some pretty significant heartburn. So to try to alleviate these concerns, uh, the AIA with the input of CMs and uh, trade subs in the industry has developed the C404, uh, which is an agreement between a contractor and a consultant for, it says design assist, I apologize, that should be delegated design services. And this is a document that we're recommending that the CM could use to hire the consultant uh, and install the metal facade. Now, while there could be a situation where the contractor may hire a consultant for a design build services associated with a particular component or system, that is not what we intended when we did the C404. Uh, it's really intended for delegated design and not design build services. So there are a variety of delegated design services that can be performed, obviously, depending on what the scope is. Um, but in our hypothetical, the consultant is really going to just perform you know, four sort of general categories of services that are up on the slide. Um, they're gonna uh, provide engineering and construction details, they're gonna do calculations for the facade. Um, they're gonna fabricate the facade. Um, they're gonna install it. And, and with regard to their engineering and construction details, uh, they're going to be signing and sealing uh, the plans. We talked earlier that the C403 for design assist services does not flow down the prime contract provisions. Is the C404 for delegated design similar to design assist in this regard, or more like traditional contractor subcontractor agreements that flow down the prime agreement? So the C404 is more like the latter because the delegated design services that are being provided by the consultant are really an extension of what the CM is gonna be legally obligated to provide to its own client. The provisions of the prime contract are going to be automatically incorporated into the C404. So the consultant is going to assume the same responsibilities and obligations to the CM that the CM is going to assume to its client under the prime contract. And likewise, the consultant is going to have the benefits of all the rights and remedies against the CM that the CM has against its own client under the prime. How about standard of care and insurance? 
So the consultant is providing here on Delegated Design professional design services to protect the public's health, safety, and welfare, much like that of the architect or the, the design professional of record. So as a result, the consultant is gonna to have to perform its services to the same standard of care that's required of the architect under the owner architect agreement. And without repeating it, that standard of care is up on the slide right now. Um, with regard to insurance coverages, um, again, because they're gonna be providing professional design services, the insurance coverages that we are requiring in the C404 of the consultant are the same ones that the architect is required to provide under the AIA's owner architect agreement, B101, et cetera, um, which includes professional liability insurance. So under the C403, there was no professional liability insurance required. Here under the C404, it is required as well. What are the construction manager and consultant's responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis the services? So the CM has to give the performance and design criteria that were established by the owner's design team to the consultant um, so that they know exactly what they have to satisfy. And the uh, consultant has to review the criteria, has to provide the design services that conform to the criteria, the applicable building code requirements and the applicable standard of care. And then they need to employ a registered design professional to sign and seal the deliverables. To what degree can anyone rely on the delegated design services? So preliminarily, the owner's design team is responsible for the adequacy and accuracy of the performance and the design criteria in the contract documents. So, so the owner's design team establishes them and they're responsible for those design and performance criteria. Then there's gonna be an element of dual reliance. The consultant is gonna be entitled to rely on the adequacy and accuracy of the performance and design criteria that are delegated to it. And the CM and architect are gonna be entitled to rely on the adequacy and accuracy of the delegated design services, certifications and approvals that the consultant provides. Now, ultimately at the end of the day, the owner's design team is gonna be responsible to verify that the consultant's design is gonna comply with the performance and design criteria. So the owner's design team is sort of at the top of, of the food chain and then at the bottom of the food chain with regard to reliance there. Robin, you've talked a lot about insurance in the context of delegate design and design assist. How about bond claims? So I, I think I'll take this one. Um, so we did talk about uh, insurance and and we mentioned bonds and um, we thought it would be prudent to just explore a little bit who might be a bond claimant where you have uh, design assist or or more commonly in the delegated design framework so uh, when you look at a typical bonding situation and you're trying to figure out who claimants might be under the bond um, one of the first questions that is usually asked is, was, was the work that the claimant is seeking payment for performed in the prosecution of the principal obligors, in this case, it would be the construction manager's work, um, and did the, did the consultant in this situation work for or contract with the CM? And the way we analyze uh, these cases often depends on the law um, and the bond and the language of the bonds themselves. So many uh, jurisdictions have statutes that will require payment and performance bonds under certain circumstances and for certain projects. Those are usually um, mandatory in when you have work being done for government agencies or where government agency somehow has a, plays a significant role uh, in connection with the project owner. Governing law usually establishes a minimum coverage um, requirement for payment bonds uh, on these types of uh, public works projects. And courts have often held that where the bond provides more coverage than governing law, 
the the bond the terms of the bond actually control and coverage is expanded beyond those minimum requirements so some basic tenants uh, to keep in mind as you're thinking about um, particularly if you're a specialty trade contractor or you're a design professional who's done work for a specialty trade contractor uh, who might need to uh, exert a claim under a payment bond to get paid for some of those design uh, based services and of course on on private projects uh, generally speaking the bond the terms of the bond itself are going to control uh, period so um, with that in mind we should take a look at perhaps a couple of the terms of the a i a a three twelve um, payment and performance bonds so in without reading all of it we have underlined and and bolded some of the key language uh, in the a three twelve itself that might um, provide some information and uh, some relief to folks that are doing uh, delegated design work for uh, for the benefit of the contractors work under a construction project um, so a claimant can be as it says an individual or any having a direct contract with the contractor in this case the CM or with a subcontractor um, and then if you read a little further you'll see and basically the language is designed to cover anybody who might otherwise uh, have a, a legitimate mechanics lien claim so so depending on your jurisdiction you might even get the sub subs uh, and so forth down the down the chain of privity in terms of of uh, claimant the other thing that uh, we wanted to point out here in light of our discussion about delegated design and and to a lesser degree design and assist is that the intent of the a312 bond is uh, to include uh, a whole host of costs that might be that that might be uh, covered by the bond for uh, subs and sub subs and and uh, other providers to the contractor or a subcontractor and it includes architectural and engineering services required for the performance of the work of the contractor and the contractor subs um, which would relate directly to delegated design uh, type services so that's that's some language out of the payment bond. Um, I think we also have some language from the performance bond uh, for those owners out there that might be wondering whether the performance bond will also uh, respond to costs that might need to be incurred um, on on the contractor on the contractor side of the contract. Uh, if if you have to call the terms of the performance bond and as you can see we've highlighted there too that costs associated with design professionals um, may also be part of uh, the costs covered by the a312 performance bond and we we just wanted to highlight these things because you know in the context of of payment and performance bonds people often think about tradespeople and others being covered but not necessarily uh, design professionals that are necessary for uh, elements of the project like delegated uh, design so um, we we point that information out to you um, and I guess in concluding uh, if an a312 is used on a project and the consultant performs its delegated design services in the prosecution of the contractors or CM's work um, then the initial question of was was the work performed by the design professional covered by the bond is very likely going to be yes um, and so you may find yourself with coverage under either a payment or performance bond situation depending on on whether you are the consultant seeking payment or the owner seeking some sort of uh, relief under the performance bond. Um, and with that, I think we can go to some questions if we have any, Hosti. 
Thank you, Ken, and thank you to all of our presenters for an excellent presentation. We do have a large number of questions and about five minutes to answer them. So let's go ahead and get started. So first off, does the consultant work for the CM or directly for the owner? The answer to that is it depends. The cons a, a consultant can work for anyone. It can work for the owner, it can work for the architect, or it can work for the CM. It, it depends on who wants to hire the consultant um, and for what purpose. Uh, I, I would suggest that if they're going to be doing um, uh, uh, design assist during the um, construction and design both phases, probably the CM is the most logical. Um, but, the, you know, a, an owner or an architect could certainly hire the consultant as well. If it's a public project, can the uh, CG use the C403 to hire a consultant who would be required to bid on the project? I don't think that there's any distinction between a a public project and a private project as far as the C403. I, I the, the document was drafted for a wide variety of uses, and I think that it probably could be used for that purpose. Ken, do you have any different thoughts? No, I, I agree with you. I think that um, it, it is pretty agnostic in terms of project type and who's going to use it. Essentially, it I think it fits almost anywhere where on any type of project, there's a need for some sort of specialized knowledge to help inform some element of the design phase, whether it's constructability review, cost estimating, somebody has a particular expertise with regard to the types of foundation work that might be needed because of soil types in a particular area. Um, and they are willing to provide reliable uh, services, but again, ultimate responsibility for the adequacy and accuracy of the design is going to rest with, um, with the design professional. Would you be considered a consultant if you provide design assist as a specialty contractor to CM and the design team? You certainly could be. Um, uh, I, I would suggest that it, it you would be considered a consultant. We didn't, you know, there there are a variety of people who can be providing design assist services. So so we went with sort of a very generic name structure as as the client and the consultant. We we did discuss and and consider using all sorts of different terms, but but ultimately decided that using a consultant would would like Ken said would, would cover a variety of of participants. Um, and again, same for client, would, would cover a variety of people who could contract for those services. Is the CM required to share the C403 with the architect? I don't think that the C403 is intended or not intended to be shared if they would share any other contract um, with the architect. They, they, the CM has no privity with the architect. And I, I can't see a time when there would be uh, an obligation to do so. But you know, with that being said, the architect, if if the consultant is going to be providing services to inform the design, then the architect is going to uh, need or want to know who the consultant is, so that they can be part of the collaborative process during the design. That the benefit of having a consultant is to involve them in the design process. So whether it's through meetings or calls or, or you know, uh, other discussions or communications, uh, it, that's the benefit of having everybody involved. So I don't know that they need to be privy to the details of the contract, but, but they probably need to be privy to the details at least of the scope that the consultant's going to be providing. Yeah, and, and Robin, I would also say the, the C403 helps, I, helps establish the rights of reliance on the information, so um, if you want to eliminate any question about um, what the responsibility is for the design professional for the ultimate design of the project, knowing that that this specialty contractor that's providing uh, design assist services has some responsibility, but not ultimate responsibility, uh, may be helpful, especially down the road. 
Well, thank you all. If we could go to the next slide, um, I can share some of the resource information because we did get a large number of questions and some were unanswered. So any questions that we couldn't get answered today, please feel free to forward them to docinfo at AIA.org. Um, so those are questions about any of our AIA documents or content or this webinar can be referred to there. Um, this webinar will be uploaded to our LEARN page, so you can access it uh, at aiacontracts.org slash learn. Um, and you will be emailed the recording as well as the PowerPoint by early next week. You will also receive an email from GoToWebinar with a certificate of completion. If you'd like, you can use that certificate to self-report uh, your attendance today to any continuing education systems. And with that, I want to thank all of our presenters for taking the, t the time today to present to this webinar, as well as thank all of the attendees for participating. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon.